Would you risk all of your investment money for a chance at generating a huge amount of income from it? Instead of waiting on your investments to gather up steam over the course of 20 years, 30 years, however long, investing in this particular thing we're going to talk about today generates so much income that it's the equivalent of you working a second job and collecting a paycheck. Or you could literally lose all of your money. So is that kind of risk reward ratio worth it? Let's talk about it. Today, let's talk about three things. Number one, what are yield max ETFs? Number two, how do they promise such incredible returns, specifically cash income? income generated by investing in them. And number three, what are the dangers of using these in your investing strategy? And the reason we're talking about this today is because I've been getting several comments about them asking my opinion about these new yield max ETFs. So I've had to do a ton of research over the last 48 hours to really try and get something like a grasp on them. It's a pretty complicated subject. And so for me to understand it, have an opinion, kind of generate something that's worth sharing took quite a while. But in doing that, I'm seeing that there is a huge amount of interest in these just overall across the internet. And I think that's because they're so darn attractive on face value. The returns they promise are truly incredible. So let's get into what exactly these things are and how they work. To really explain this, we're going to start from the bottom and kind of work our way up because it's fairly complicated. So what they do to generate income whenever you invest money into this ETF, they use what's called a synthetic covered call options strategy. And doing that complicated like word vomit generates income for you. Think of it this way. It's like a turbocharged dividend ETF. Instead of getting three, four, five percent in terms of dividends every year that are paid to you, these might give you 20, 30, 40, 50 percent income, maybe even more. So let's take that term, that synthetic covered call option strategy, and let's break that down into bite-sized chunks so we can kind of understand what's happening there. Still very complicated. I still don't understand it all the way, but I'm going to break it down for you as well as I can. First off, what is a call option? Well, it's a kind of investing that you can do that's in the stock market. It's related to the stock market, but it makes things more complicated than just buying and owning a little piece of a company. A call option is what's called a financial derivative. That's a whole kind of family of crazy moves you can make in the stock market. And what it does is it gives the owner of the call option the right to buy a specific security at a set price and within a certain time period. So think of it this way. It gives you the option to call in and buy this thing. It's almost like if you went to a store and you reserve the option to be able to buy something. Like you go to the Axe store, Axe is RS, and you say, hey, I want to buy this Trooper rehandled double bit Axe, please. But I don't want to buy it right now. Sometime in the next 60 days, I want to be able to walk in here and buy this Axe for a hundred bucks. Can you like lock that in for me? And in this case, the broker would say, yeah, sure. We can lock that in for you. No problem. We will give you the option to call this in, to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. And the reason somebody would do this kind of thing is it gives you a lot of power in terms of what you can trade, in terms of what you're investing in, but you don't have to have as much money to realize all that power. It's basically saying if you're clever enough to predict what those set parameters should be in terms of price and the time period, if you can predict what people will want to do, then you can take advantage of this. And so it's extremely powerful if you get it right. If you get it wrong, you're set up to lose your investment. Okay, so that's the base level, that's a call option. The next step up from there is a covered call. So it's a version of a call option, it's a strategy you can do within call options. And specifically, investors use covered calls to generate income. And so the strategy here is you buy a stock, let's say you buy Apple, and at the same time, you write a call option that gives someone else the right to buy your stock. You're saying, I'm the one who owns the axes now, I'm the one who's gonna be able to sell these to you, and so I'll write you an option to buy them if you want to. Then what you do is you collect the option premium, the, the payment that it costs for someone to opt into that. And then you hope that the option expires worthless. You're hoping that they don't take advantage of that. And in the meantime, you get to just collect that little fee for having held the option. That's just how this is set up. That's how the financial world has set this up. That's the way this works. There is that fee involved. The only tricky thing about this is that although it generates the income, you can also limit the profit potential you have for owning that stock. Like let's say if Apple shoots up in price, now you don't get to take advantage of that. And the reason for that is the person who's buying that option will then go ahead and exercise their right to buy it. They'll be like, well, okay, you said that you were going to sell me this ax at a hundred bucks. Well, now the price of axes is, is 150 bucks. So I'm going to go ahead and call my option in and say, yeah, I'm going to buy that ax because I'm only paying a hundred for it. Now it's worth 150. I'm absolutely going to take advantage of that. And so because you're selling away your option to do that, you're not taking advantage of that price movement. You're only collecting that little premium and basically your benefit is very limited. Again, it's like being able to predict the parameters that this thing is going to move, set up a boundary in which you can benefit from doing that, and then just crossing your fingers and hoping it works. So we've defined a call option, we've defined a covered call and how that works. Now, what the heck is a synthetic covered call? So if you remember, the covered call worked because we owned 
that stock. We owned the stock of Axis or of Apple or whatever it is we're talking about in this example. In this example, mostly we talked about Axis. We've owned the Axis, and so we have the right to offer them up for sale within the parameters we've set forth. But what you can do in the finance world, because this world is a very complicated place and there's all these kinds of different ways to manipulate money and manipulate the option to buy and sell stuff, what you can do is replicate essentially the same exact thing as that covered call by selling puts. So think of it this way. A put is the opposite of a call. It gives you the right to sell a specific stock at a specific price on or before a specific date. So the call option was us going into the store and saying, I want to have the option to buy this. A put is saying, I want the option to sell that. And so the crazy thing is that because a put is basically the opposite of a call, instead of generating income by owning that underlying stock, whether that's Apple or Tesla or whoever it is, having to have all that capital, buy the stock, have this warehouse full of stock, if you will, and then decide, oh, we want to generate income from this. Let's do covered calls. That's required all of this money to have all of this stock laying around. All of that silly terminology and all those silly examples to say what a synthetic covered call lets you do is take advantage of all the benefits of having a covered call without having to have all this money up front to do it. It would be like if a store was able to take advantage of having the option of selling all this merchandise to you, but they didn't have to buy the merchandise up front. You can see here on the screen what the portfolio components are. And so what they're putting together is a short put plus a long call to give you basically a long stock position and then they're doing a short call option to give you income. And so they're putting all that together to create a covered call for you. And so then as collateral, what they do is they buy treasuries to be able to have that money there in case that money is called upon based on the way that this money is being traded around and how it's being used. And in this conversation, a lot of times what we talk about too is margin, which is essentially leverage. It's, it's debt that you can take out to then multiply the power of your money. This is not using leverage. This is just using these very specific, fairly complex derivative strategies to create basically the, the simulation of having owned all these different securities in different ways to then take advantage of that and generate a huge amount of income. So let's move into part two here. How exactly in doing all this complicated financial work, do they promise such incredible returns and in returns specifically in cash income generated by investing through these things? Because we know that there are certain stocks that have grown a lot. Like Tesla a few years ago grew a bunch. People had invested in it at a lower price. It went up to a higher price. They realized the difference. They made money that way. Similar thing has happened recently with NVIDIA. People have gone crazy for NVIDIA because of their chips, because of their critical role in AI and what that could mean for the future. And so their stock price has just skyrocketed in the past. And so if you owned it at a a cheaper price, it's appreciated, it's gone up in value. That's just growth. This is not the same thing as what yield max ETFs are doing. Specifically, what they're doing is generating these strategies that then kick off cash. It's not like the yield max ETF is going up in value, up in price. What's happening is it's doing these little strategies. It's generating these events that kick off cash that are then distributed to people like you and me whenever we invest in them. The most often way that's happened that I've seen on their different schedules and on their website is that they distribute that cash monthly to us. So you put money into them. Let's say you put $10,000 into a specific yield max ETF, then every month you would get a cash dividend deposited into your account. That's why in the beginning of the video, I basically said this is like turbocharged dividend stocks. It's giving you a massive dividend because of these financial strategies they're using. And so what these fund managers are doing is they're guessing what the specific stock is going to be doing in the nearest term, thinking one to six months in advance. They're not looking out further than a year. They're specifically looking at fairly short term events and then trying to set those parameters we talked about in the call options to be able to set everybody up to make the most income possible. They're using their big brains and their big research and their big funding to bet that they are right. They're betting that what their prediction is will be true enough to generate a bunch of income. It's gonna be within the range that they want. The stock isn't gonna to move too far up. The stock isn't gonna to move too far down. But how those incredible returns are generated is because of that call option strategy and because it's a synthetic call option strategy, they can kind of multiply the power of your money because they don't have to have everybody's money sitting there owning that underlying stock. They pay the other players in the financial world to simulate owning those different underlying stocks. That's a synthetic part of it. And then as long as the next few months play out the way that they predicted, then the income generated off of that is truly huge. What kind of huge income are we talking about? Let's look at some examples. The Yield Max Tesla Options Income Strategy ETF, TSLY. The distribution rate, which is essentially like the yearly dividend, 80%. The Yield Max Apple Option Income Strategy, the version of this for Apple, the company, almost 22% right now. The NVIDIA version of this is totally ridiculous, 116% per year. And then on their website, they have this full list of all the different ones you can invest in, what the distribution rate is, and what the expense ratios are. It's this column here that we're looking at, this distribution rate column, and it is pretty ridiculous. The Amazon one, 45%. Meta, 49%. Google, 
34%. Coin, 101%. These are totally ridiculous whenever we look at dividends typically and think, oh, somewhere between 2 and 5% is probably a healthy amount, depending on the payout ratio, depending on what the company's doing, how their cash flow is, how their profitability is. Maybe they can keep paying that dividend forever. Maybe they can grow it year over year. That'd be really great. This is a whole different ballgame. This is nuking those normal returns. It's absolutely ridiculous. 10 times more returns, 20 times more returns than a standard dividend stock or ETF. But what are the dangers of investing in this? If it was perfectly safe, we'd all be doing it, right? So there must be some kind of risk. There must be some kind of exposure, right? Well, if you jump into the prospectus statements of each of these ETFs, which is a giant long PDF outlining everything they're doing, what all their fees are, what all the risks are, just a ton of information about the investment, basically. Each one of these has unique risks that are laid out based on its own exposure, based on its place in the market. So this would be an hour long video if I went through and reviewed all of those for all of the ETFs because there are just that many. And to a degree, YieldMax has to lay all that stuff out. You know, it's part of what they're required to do to build these investments and be able to offer it to the public is to say, yes, technically these are risks. We are obligated to lay them out. We're obligated to say, watch out whenever you swing on the playground. If you fall off the swing, you might crack your head on the ground. Technically, it's a possibility. It, it's happened in the past. You could have it happen. We've just got to tell you about it. And so as investors, we have the opportunity to blow off these risks and say, well, yeah, there's a chance that stuff happens, but will it really happen? Are we going to count on that kind of thing happening? Probably not. At least not all of them at the same time. You know, some of them might happen here and there, but what does that mean for us as investors? How do we know what's really going to happen and not? Well, I think some of the risks are actually guaranteed to happen. Some of these negatives are baked into what it means to invest in these things and they're inescapable. Other ones are definitely optional. We don't know if or when or how they could ever potentially happen. Technically, they're there, but I wouldn't lose any sleep over them. So let's go over the main ones that I think are consistent throughout a lot of these ETFs or stood out to me as something notable and worth talking about. I've got nine of them. Number one, an inescapable one, high expense ratios. On average, whenever I look at that list, I think it's around 1%. Some of them are a little under, some of them are a little over, but regardless, this drag on your investment return is going to consistently and exponentially over time remove profit that you could have kept if that fee was lower. And remember, these managers are getting this fee regardless of the performance, so they're making money even when you're not. It's an objectively high fee, but you might be looking at that going, I don't really care if I'm making a 100% return, right? Okay, let's keep going. Risk number two that's not in the prospectus, but it's just something that I'm interpolating as a part of human psychology is that people are are blinded by the potential yield here. We are salivating over this promise of something completely amazing, life-changing returns here. Because something like a 20%, 50%, 100% annual dividend with a monthly payout is so rare, I think that people are willing to overlook all the downsides and risks and potential negatives because they're just so hopeful of all this working out for them. You know, if I put $100,000 into this and it generates me $100,000 in income, I don't need to work. My family's taken care of. We don't do anything. We just make a hundred grand every year, like clockwork. We don't have to worry about life anymore. The standard retirement calculation that everyone's used for a long time is the 25X rule, that you have to save up 25 times your yearly expenses to be able to safely withdraw that every year and, and cover your expenses and not worry about losing all of your principal. This is saying, no, the return is 25 times more than that. So you only need to save one times your annual spending. Save your yearly salary once, invest it once, you're good to go, you're done. And the opportunity of that, I think, is just intoxicating for people. You read things online, you read different comments and how excited people are about this and how amazed they are that this is happening for them. And they're shouting from the rooftops, you know? They're evangelists for this kind of thing. And if it works out, I can see why. Risk number three is called counterparty risk. And I didn't know what this was until I did this research, so maybe we'll learn what this is together. The way I think of it is the money that's used in this fund is commingled with other funds and other people who are involved. It's not like YieldMax holds all this money themselves. They have to go out and put it into the stock market system with all those middlemen. And so your money is commingled with all the other people's money who are held with that same middleman. And so if that clearinghouse or whoever that middleman is goes bankrupt or implodes like Synapse did recently, your money isn't guaranteed. If that pool of money suddenly goes away, they're not saying you will for sure have your money back. Risk number four with these is that they're extremely new. They're very unproven and we don't know what they're going to do long term. A lot of these things are a year old or less than a year old. And so they're very, very, very new. The old adage is always true, which is that past performance doesn't guarantee anything in terms of future performance, but anything this new, it's unproven. Risk number five is called distribution risk. And so what they're saying here is that you have no guarantee whatsoever that they're going to be paying a distribution 
Distributions is another word for a dividend. They say right here in their prospectus that if the fund does make distributions, the amounts of such distributions will likely vary greatly from one distribution to the next. Additionally, the monthly distributions, if any, may consist of returns of capital, which would decrease the fund's NAV and trading price over time. And then here's the kicker. As a result, the investor may suffer significant losses to their investment. So these beautiful shiny numbers of the distribution rate is based on the most recent yield, but it's not a promise of what's going to happen for the next 12 months by any means. They're just taking what's happened recently, multiplying that out to give us a yearly rate and advertising it, hoping that we bite. Another reality, not so much a risk, is number six, that you don't get a dividend from the underlying company. So if you own Apple stock or some other company in here that has a dividend, since you don't own that stock, you don't get paid a dividend. Now, we wouldn't be doing this to get the dividend because you're getting the income that's being generated by the derivatives. But in the end, it's good to know that. Like, it's good to realize, hey, you're not getting a dividend from them. This is a whole different strategy. It's just related to that company. And then number seven is a corollary to that, just so that we're very clear. You have no principal, no equity in that company. Company. You don't own shares of Tesla or Apple or whoever else the underlying company is. You're buying into this complex financial strategy to attempt to generate a return in the form of income. So it would be unwise to then look at the price of, the, of Tesla or whoever and say, oh good, it's going up in value. I've got this Tesla yield max ETF. That's good for me. It's not that simple. It's much more complex than that. Risk number eight is that you're giving up potential upside if that underlying stock rises in price over those set targets. So whenever they've set up this option strategy and they've said, we only want it to move within this range, if it goes way above that, you are limiting your upside. And the big, big corollary to that is you are accepting all the potential exacerbated downside of that risky option strategy. They say right there in their own documents that your losses could even be larger than the amount you invested. We're talking about negative money here, guys. If you ask me, that's the scariest risk of them all. If everything works perfectly, if it all happens just the way we planned, 20, 50, 100% return every year in terms of a cash back dividend situation is amazing. But if it goes south, it could go really, really badly for us. The last risk, number nine, is even if it goes well for us, as far as I understand how this structure is set up, these dividends they're giving you are unqualified. And so what that means is they're taxed as ordinary income, similar to any W-2 job where you collect a paycheck. And basically that's the highest tax rate you could possibly have. Now that's a good problem to have because you have income, so it's getting taxed, but it's not tax advantaged in some specific way. It's not like it's long-term capital gains rates. It's the maximum amount you're getting taxed. And so if you don't have it in some specific tax advantaged account, that means that you're not getting taxed on it, like a Roth IRA or something, that means that that tax isn't automatically withdrawn from your dividend paycheck. So at the end of the tax year, you're going to have to cough up that money. Like if in my example, I put in a hundred grand and I was collecting a hundred grand in income, I would still have to pay taxes on that at the end of the year in February or March or April. So that means you've got to be ready for that. Just be aware if even if things go well, you've got to be ready to pay taxes on it. Overall, I would say my summary of this thing, in my opinion, is that the old adage rings true. There's no such thing as a free lunch. What I mean by that is you can't expect to get a 20% or 100% dividend without there being significantly more risk than a standard kind of investment in a dividend paying stock that only gets you a 2% dividend. If it was really this good, if it was really perfectly safe and you could just expect to get a crazy return, everyone would be doing this. The whole world would be shoveling money into this and make it the most popular investment ever. But the reward is only only possible because of the risk. Be aware of that. Tread very lightly. Do your own research. Invest in a way that makes sense to you. And if this whole video is completely over your head and you have no idea how the stock market works, then buy my class, which is linked in the description. The secret comment word for today is lunch because there's no such thing as a free lunch. I hope you're all having a wonderful summer and I'll see you next time. Bye.